everyone and uh, welcome to ORF and uh, apologies for starting a bit late but uh, as you know there is much happening uh, around uh, in India and in, around Delhi in particular so uh, we thought we would give a breather of five to ten minutes before we start uh, but as you see uh, we today uh, rather than talking about the, the north which is discussing, uh, which is sort of dominating the discourse. Uh, we are talking about uh, the maritime space uh, and, the, and the construction of, uh, of the Indo-Pacific as a narrative uh, which has dominated Indian discourse, uh, which has been dominating Indian strategic discourse for, for some years now. Uh, and in fact, uh, now as we look towards the new unfolding dynamic in the region, uh, it is quite clear that Indo-Pacific as a construct uh, is now no, going nowhere in a hurry. We are now looking uh, or anticipating very soon uh, Southeast Asia, ASEAN coming up with its Indo-Pacific construct where Indo in Indonesia is playing an important role. Uh, so therefore, we thought it would be very useful to have a discussion on uh, Indonesia-India relations as well as the larger idea behind uh, different interpretations of Indo-Pacific uh, emanating from the region. Uh, and I, I don't think um, you know we, we we would have got a better set of people to discuss this as we have here with us today, uh, and uh, of course we have uh, the ambassador of Indonesia with us, uh, His Excellency uh, Siddhartho. Um, uh, he, uh, he he managed to find time, uh, and he decided ma he agreed to come. Uh, and we also have uh, Vibhanshu Shekhar. He is uh, he has he has been uh, he has written a recent book on India Indonesia relations and Indonesia? Indonesia, in, Indonesia Indonesian foreign policy, yeah. and um, uh, he uh, has been working on this topic for some time. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, one of our uh, few scholars after. Professor Ghoshal here, who have looked at the region uh, in, in this manner, and then we uh, and then we thought that we also have Pramesha here, who is also a, a, a beginning to work on this topic and has uh, and has been looking at the region uh, for us at, at ORF, uh, and I and uh, and I think uh, a, a discussion on this topic is important because uh, we have engaged. Uh, uh, as, as two nations who have a stake in what happens in the Indo-Pacific geography. Uh, India and Indonesia have been engaged in this discussion for some time uh, with some differences, but I think mostly convergences that have emerged over the last, uh, over the last few years. Uh, so with that, uh, I think uh, the ambassador suggested that uh, the scholar should start, which is quite generous uh, of the ambassador. Uh, so let, us give the, let me give the floor to Vibhanshu. Uh, who is at the moment scholar in residence at the American University in Washington? Uh, but I, and I also want to add that uh, we studied together in JNU, so that has but that has nothing to do with. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Hars, uh, for agreeing to convene this conversation, and thank you, Ambassador, for uh, agreeing to uh, be here and uh, share your views with us. I have been trying to study uh, both Indonesia and India, Indonesia. Uh, relations for some time and have been trying to explore different ways to frame India-Indonesia relations, sometimes as two democracies, sometimes as two Asian neighbors, sometimes as two maritime powers. And these are different frames of reference that people have used to look at India-Indonesia relations. This year, uh, 2019-2020 is 70th year of India-Indonesia relations. So let me, uh, so I thought that maybe I'll try something different. And, uh, uh, and I also thought that I'll connect that, that the new approach with, with the book that I uh, wrote about. So let me start with what is it that Indonesia rise, what does it mean? And uh, uh, from that vantage point, then I'll explain how, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll actually reach out to the issue of how two rising powers, uh, how they're fated to, to develop a very important Asian relationship uh, in, an, in an uncertain Indo-Pacific region. So with that, uh, The 21st century Indonesia 
if you know, in 1999 and 2000, it was a very different story. Almost every major island of Indonesia was in trouble, had lots of conflict, lots of uncertainty there. It, it heralded itself into a very different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, profile in less than 15 years. And by, uh, by 2019, it's, it's, it's going to have another uh, uh, election, presidential election in April. It has emerged as the third largest democracy with a very vibrant political debate, with lots of drama and lots of excitement. Uh, it's too bad that I'm not able to uh, watch this time, but those who are watching, it must be a lot of fun. So some basic aspects of how Indonesia is rising, what does that mean? One, that it's a, what I term as a democratic revolution in Indonesia. It's the third largest democracy and the largest democracy in the Muslim world. Economic resurgence. Since 70s, actually, if we, if we cut short that late 90s time frame and a few years of 2000s, then it had like almost five decades of sustained five to 6% and more growth rates. And that's a, that's a very momentous. Uh, GDP of uh, uh, US $3 trillion in terms of PPP that it would become when it becomes uh, uh, one of the uh, fourth largest, fourth largest uh, Asian economy. And by some estimate, it will be the fourth largest global economy by 2050. And that's a big, big feat. Demographic revolution, 20, 20, 20, 20, 30 is considered as the golden decade. How much Indonesia is able to use that decade, of course, depends a lot on Indonesia's own domestic vitality, institutional uh, support system, and uh, political willingness. Uh, maritime resurgence, uh, I'll, I can talk a little bit about it in, in the sense that since 2001, there has been a sustained, somewhat gradual attempt to uh, uh, reassert Indonesia's maritime identity. It has always been an archipelagic nation state, but also like in terms of the maritime identity, it somehow, uh, uh, somehow it, it, it disappeared uh, uh, during uh, the Suharto era and it became uh, what they call an inward looking uh, uh, Indonesia. We're confined to, uh, we're confined to uh, Southeast Asia and not really paying much attention to what Mohammed Hatta once called two ocean, two continent uh, a framework. So now again, it's it's reasserting. It's some of there are, there are some uh, doctrinal improvements, some force posture, and some uh, capacity augmentation as well. And of course, digital revolution. Indonesia is, Jakarta is considered as a Twitter capital of the world. And that kind of gives a sense as to where, it's not just Indonesia, India as well, they both are the, probably one of the largest democratizing societies in the world, two of the largest. So because of this change in Indonesia's capacity, a change in its, its, uh, its outlook, that has also reflected the way it's projecting its international status. And there are four areas that I have identified. Maritime projection, quest for great power parity and partnerships. It's trying to go beyond ASEAN frameworks, post-ASEAN framework, non-ASEAN frameworks as well. Expanded canvas projections. In order to explain these, these trends, let me just, this is, this is the maritime thing. So if, Earlier, Indonesia's important naval headquarters and everything were located here. This is Jakarta, Surabaya. So this was the eastern and this was the western. Now this thing is changing. Now they're just moving towards north. We have western fleet like will be here. Submarine <coughs> base there, west central fleet and eastern fleets towards Papua. Now that, that shows a different set of force uh, uh, posture for Indonesia. They're also reclaiming uh, all these outer islands around which they could identify as some sort of island chain uh, as, as an important line of defense. And so far, uh, 112 
outermost islands they have identified. Submarine base, if, if this and the center of the here, it provides an important force posture towards this part, which is like South China Sea and further here. And unfortunately, they had a tsunami in Palu, uh, I think it was last year, or was, I think last year. So I don't know if that has made a change in any uh, change in the plan or this is this is the idea behind this changing Mandala worldviews of Indonesia is that it's not just a debate for Indonesia that it will talk about in the Pacific. It is its larger canvas. It considers itself as an Indo-Pacific power. And the shift is a gradual, and it's seeping deep into its strategic thinking, which means that it's going to continue to be an important player. It's going to continue to posture itself as an important player in the Indo-Pacific. And then if these are the cases, then it seems important for us also, for India also, to uh, engage Indonesia at, at that level in, in, in those sense and in those contexts. Now, a rising Indonesia, a rising India, these, they have created important momentums. And these momentums have led to a very strong foundation of India-Indonesia relations. As you can see, I have identified certain areas. Now there's a vision, there's a roadmap where they want to go ahead. They have important frameworks, a definitive and strategic framework they have, like those doctrinal uh, frameworks. They also have a sense of the two countries have put in place a sense of parity in terms of strategic partnerships. And by, by elevating it to comprehensive strategic partnership, which earlier the uh, uh, Indonesia uh, did in, I think, 2015 or 16 with China. More uh, institutionalized frameworks. May 2018 was an important year. A lot of new incentives, not a lot of new initiatives were taken. Expanding content of the relationship. Introduction of niche areas, space, cyber, these are important areas they were introduced and like deliberated on. Though contents might be missing. Lofty economic goals, US $50 billion trade by 2025. Uh, Of course, there are challenges in this gamut of <coughs> relationship. If you look at, if you compare India-Indonesia partnership with other partnerships, like say, Indonesia-China partnership, say, Indonesia-Japan partnership, Indonesia-South Korea partnership, there, there is still a, a limited content in, in, in the partnership, in, in, the, in, the, in the overall outline of where India-Indonesia partnership should be headed. So not in a content in defense and security cooperation either, limited trade. It missed the 2015 uh, uh, target by, I think, nearly 10, $10 billion. It was supposed to be 25. It ended up somewhere around 15, 16 billion. It was going great uh, till 2011 and 12, when it reached up to, I think, $21 billion. But then it started, for different reasons, started. India was also recorrecting itself. So then the uh, so then it went down to I think fourteen, then finally fifteen was that was kind of achieved. Limited trade basket. India's focus is on coal and palm oil. Bilateral investment very minimal. There were lots of projects, 50, 60 projects worth probably seventy five million, hundred million, two hundred million, which is very small compared to say annual like $4 billion investment coming from Japan, $6 billion coming from Singapore and, and other uh, important players. There's always a problem for implementation. So looking at the two rising powers, looking at the content of the cooperation, I think it's, I have, I thought it best to connect the two and identify certain areas where there is a greater there is a greater momentum and where the two countries could connect and of course there are some already happening there one is the india indonesia maritime cooperation uh, at the doctrinal level there is a, a convergence of 
India as a net security provider that it claims, and Indonesia as a global maritime fulcrum. They are two different doctrines. They they also entail two different set of uh, assumptions and positions. Net security provider, India has its has a deeper role in it as a global uh, maritime fulcrum. Provides more uh, uh, more as 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 an as an avenue as 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 a nodal through which it could interconnect multiple players and multiple uh, uh, interests together, keeping an eye on the state of Malacca and Indian Ocean. That's a, that's a very important uh, uh, point. What, uh, of course, last year they did the uh, India and Indonesia agreed to develop the Sawang port in Sumatra. A lot has been written uh, since last year that in, in, very, in various contexts. It was also uh, talked about as, as a development initiative, as, uh, as a balancing initiative. I think we might miss the point. The Savan Initiative has two important roles that we should not forget. One, it's a development initiative, and India is playing and posing itself as an important development player, as an investment player. If it doesn't work, India's track record so far in Myanmar and South, mainland Southeast Asia, they have not been exemplary. In 25 years, only one project has been completed, that's Friendship Road. Trilateral Highway, Kaladan, Adeli Hanoi, I, I'm not sure as to what stays and at what level of progress they are. But they were supposed to be completed long, long, long ago. So this is, the, in, in, in that sense, it's a litmus test for India. If India wants to be a major development player that it should, this is, this is the chance. Second, it's also a diversification strategy for Indonesia. I think I should have it. Yes. Uh-oh. <coughs> So this is, I'm trying to uh, identify three important projects that Indonesia has undertaken. And they entail uh, different, uh, uh, Indonesia's bargaining uh, uh, game with three different players, China, Japan, and, and India. It, it explains why Indonesia would not be engaging in any balancing uh, uh, narrative in, in any way, major way. It would rather be engaging in what one can call equilateral alignment. And so this, this diversification has been going on vis-a-vis -vis its traditional, uh, Indonesia's traditional strategic partners. So coming back to the Asian players, we look at here, this was Jakarta Bandung Highway. This was an important uh, uh, gambit where Japan lost and China won. Uh, Tanya, this is again a mega project, Paribara project, this is big, uh, a six, seven billion dollar project of uh, uh, port in Jakarta, and that is the Savan port project. If this works, then this places India as an important player. If it doesn't work, if it gets delayed, if it gets lost, that will also reflect on India as, 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 as a player. Just uh, uh, two points. Both because they're rising powers, they're projecting as maritime power side, it seems. It, 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 might be, uh, it might be worth suggesting that there should be something definitive, distinctive about uh, uh, this partnership by doing something concrete. And I thought that I would make my own humble suggestions on this. I avoid doing that, but I thought I would do it. One is joint production of a naval ship. This, shape, this can take a different shape. And I'm not, suggest, this, I'm not the first one to suggest this. I, I had the chance to visit uh, Indonesia's shipbuilding uh, factory at PT Pal in Surabaya. And there I had a con uh, uh, some kind of say, a conversation with some people, and it was suggested that why not India and Indonesia do something together. 
uh, uh, Indonesia has already done a submarine project with South Korea, so why not do something, if not at a very ambitious scale, at least something uh, uh, that they could do together. Second, is if, we, if India and Indonesia could venture into some sort of a, a joint initiative towards mar maritime domain awareness, that would cover almost the entire Indian Ocean. Uh, and also uh, an important uh, area of the Western, uh, part of Western Pacific. This is, this that will be their contribution towards a broader Pan-Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Project. And this project is all, I had a, a, a chance to listen to some people in DC and there was this idea coming up that a Pan-Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Network is being talked about. So that would also uh, uh, can be an important, that can be an important uh, uh, contribution from India and Indonesia to rising maritime powers. Building an ASEAN plus and post ASEAN regional order in the Indo-Pacific region. This, uh, uh, as we all know, there's a lot happening in the Indo-Pacific, a lot of versions coming up. Indonesia has its own uh, versions, multiple versions within Indonesia. How much time do I have? Okay. So in Indonesia has uh, its own multiple uh, versions on the Indo-Pacific. But certain, uh, certain trends are coming out. One is that in Indonesian version on the Indo-Pacific, East Asia Summit is likely to play a central role in it. And uh, India is a member of it. So if India, is, if India and Indonesia can work towards a stable regional order by infusing more and more inputs, more and more energy, and uh, more and more energy into uh, East Asia Summit, I think that's, that's worthwhile. Invite ASEAN members, including Indonesia, to take part in the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor Initiative. Probably uh, people here can tell me more on that as to what is the current status. Uh, and if that invitation has been extended or not, but that's something worth looking. Greater bilateral coordination into multilateral forums like Indian Ocean Rim Association and G20 forums. That could be something that they could look into. And I think these are, these are the suggestions that have already been put forth by, uh, by people, by experts. Do India and Indonesia differ on the Indo-Pacific debate? There, there are some differences, and I think it's worth taking note of. I think till the formation, till the re resurrection of the quadrilateral strategic dialogue, both India and Indonesia were thinking of Indo-Pacific as a, as a special construct, as a geographic, geopolitical co uh, construct. But it seems that after that, there has been a, a change in the, in, the, the, in the approach of the two countries towards the Indo-Pacific. It seems that there is a, uh, there is a a trend within Indonesia, there's a thinking, a dominant thinking, that FOIP, this free and open Indo-Pacific, and Quad, they are essentially a great power narrative, and Indo-Pacific along with it is becoming more as a great power narrative rather than as a simple benign special construct. And that, that difference needs to be somewhere uh, uh, discussed. India's emphasis is on geopolitics, security, and China challenge. Indonesia's is on economics and inclusion of China. It, it has emphasized on, on an inclusive approach. A concept must not be used as a containment approach. I thought that I would just highlight to reinforce my argument. It was a statement that made by Ibu Retno Marsudi in January 2018. So a, de a common Indo-Pacific approach taking into account these, di these differences of opinion is, is something that one should look into. And that would also help Indonesia in, in, in coming up with their own more, most acceptable uh, Indo-Pacific uh, uh, approach before uh, uh, this goes to larger ASEAN deliberation, before it goes to larger East Asia deliberations. So bilateral, going towards uh, ASEAN level, then going towards East Asia level, maybe this is the time uh, that uh, uh, these inputs could be uh, uh, put forth. I, I think probably not many people, but I do think that Indonesia should join the Quad. 
And I'm not the only one who has made that suggestion. And I made that suggestion in probably foolishly in, 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 in Jakarta in May 2018. Uh, and uh, uh, they were all looking at me like, what? But anyway, uh, I, I keep insisting on it. I don't see with that <laughs> <I know. laughs> So there you go. But I keep insisting on it for multiple reasons. One, if the idea is to build a stable regional order, Indonesia is probably one of the best candidates as the master architect of regional cooperation, how the whole processes have, whether we talk about ASEAN process, whether we talk about post-ASEAN process, the way uh, Indonesia uh, uh, conducted its leadership in the Indian Ocean uh, 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 as a chair of the Indian Ocean RIM Association, that is, that's, that's, that's worth uh, uh, looking into. That's one. At the second, uh, uh, Indonesia's entry would also pro give a broader appeal to, uh, uh, to, to the coordinator strategic dialogue. And uh, uh, I think that's, that's all that I have to say. Uh, thank you, Vivanchu. I think um, uh, you, know, you, you have raised a few issues which perhaps the ambassador is the best person to respond to. But I would just uh, highlight that uh, uh, as we look forward to ASEAN coming out with the Indo-Pacific construct, it's not entirely evident that um, we have time and space to first have the sort of bilateral conversation that you were suggesting. So I think that bus has already passed because ASEAN is coming with a construct. Uh, the other is, I think, Quad. By definition, it won't be Quad if Indonesia is part of it. Um, but again, uh, the issue is that uh, is the quad as a fiat a cohesive enough concept so that we start talking of quad plus or are we looking at the discussions even within the four quad members uh, with a certain degree of, um, of bewilderment because even their constructs of Indo-Pacific itself differ. Uh, so Japanese and American version of Indo-Pacific are quite distinct from the Indian version. And I think Indian, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Modi's speech at Shangri-La where he put ASEAN at the center of the Indo-Pacific is very interesting because uh, in some ways that takes uh, that takes the edge away from the sort of uh, uh, you know the the issues that Indonesia might raise, as, as you raise in your presentation about uh, this being an exclusive or inclusive concept. Where uh, India seemed to be suggesting that it, it 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 is moving towards that vision where it is more of an inclusive concept and where China is part of it. But I think uh, let me ask uh, His Excellency uh, the Ambassador to respond and as well as to comment on uh, how this relationship is going and perhaps on some of the suggestions that have been made here. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pan. Uh, thank you, Vibanchu, for a very interesting presentation. Um, it's a continuation of conversation we've been having for a number of years uh, in DC, in New Delhi. Um, and good morning to uh, everybody. Uh, let me just say I'm uh, very pleased to be here. Um, I also have some uh, colleagues from Jakarta, researchers from our uh, Ministry of uh, Policy Planning uh, Division. Um, if they can just raise their hands to be recognized. Um, they are here to do some research on Indo-Pacific. Um, India, Indonesia, we are celebrating 70 years of full diplomatic relations. Um, I use those terms uh, very carefully. Um, it is part of our modern history. However, as we all know, uh, relations between India, Indonesia, goes back since time immemorial. Um, I would like to say that we go back since the time of, uh, of uh, uh, what, um, uh, Ramayana, and uh, just to, to show that uh, it's, it's become uh, abstract, thousands of years. Um, but, uh, and I think it's important to, to uh, emphasize this, because apart from uh, modern thinking, modern calculations, Indians and Indonesians, uh, they, in many ways, they think alike. They are comfortable with uh, each other. There is no, uh, I think, there is no perception of threat uh, of the other, which all form a very important foundation uh, when it comes to state to state, uh, country to country, people to people relations. Now, uh, for uh, Vibanchu gave uh, uh, one perspective um, of Indonesia foreign policy, Indo-Pacific. I'll give you uh, another perspective. 
uh, likely it's likely that we'll, we are speaking of the same thing, but using different words. Um, his is uh, as a scholar, uh, mine as a part of the Indonesian Foreign Service for the past uh, 27 years. Um, so um, uh, I, I use that perspective. 27 years, I think many of you maybe were, were not born or very young. Uh, some of us were definitely younger. Uh, it, it was a very different world. Uh, we just came out of the Cold War. Um, and in the early 90s, a few important things uh, took place that shaped the world today and shaped our thinking. Um, globalization uh, also meant that um, the barriers to uh, more transport, information exchange uh, were lifted. People traveled more. There was a revolution in transportation, revolution in information. Um, and that's uh, what globalization is, uh, transfer of uh, goods, of uh, finances. At the same time, also, uh, it brought about uh, wider epidemics, um, uh, issues like um, terrorism, uh, climate change. Um, so. On one, one side, we had opportunities. On the other side, we had also challenges. There was a convergence of politics, economics, uh, socio-cultural. Um, there was, uh, on one hand, globalization. On the other hand, there was a growing uh, narrow nationalism. So this was the world that was uh, forming uh, before us. The rise of countries and shifting of relationship uh, between countries, um, the, the, the thinking is more of avoiding a zero-sum game in this relationship. And these are uh, reflected in institutions that were developed. Uh, you will see the uh, um, uh, in the region, uh, this kind of uh, institutions. Uh, there was also the growing importance of, of the ocean. Uh, more people are moving things through the oceans, uh, having economic uh, activities in the ocean. More countries have their uh, security and prosperity tied to the oceans and tied to the uh, ocean routes. From, uh, if you were in Jakarta, from uh, the perspective of Jakarta, seeing these this changes, um, so from in the beginning, Southeast Asia was key to Indonesia. Um, it was an area of, uh, at the time, of uh, great power tension, great power conflict. So 27 years ago, uh, Southeast Asia had just come out of the um, Indochina conflicts. Uh, it was very fresh in everybody's mind. Uh, we formed uh, ASEAN itself. Uh, had always had an inclusive approach. It had dialogue partners, but it brought then all the dialogue partners uh, into one session. Uh, and then out of this, we created what is called the ASEAN Regional Forum. Um, and then as a corollary, also the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. Um, these were institutions built. Um, and then for Indonesia was also uh, had a particular attention to its south, which was Australia. Uh, bilateral mechanisms uh, were built. And then subsequently, in the early 2000s, uh, greater attention towards its um, uh, eastern flank, which was the Western Pacific. Uh, it was an area of uh, growing interest for Indonesia. So you would see uh, the development of institutions like the Southwest Pacific Dialogue, the Coral Triangle Initiatives. Um, Indonesia became observer of the Pacific Islands Forum. Um, and then lately of the Pacific Islands Development Forum, um, and also established diplomatic relations with almost uh, all Western Pacific countries. And then uh, about uh, a few years ago, uh, greater attention on the Indian Ocean. So we became very active in the Indian Ocean Rim Association, leading to the uh, summit in 2015. Um, we became more active in India's Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. Uh, greater attention to uh, Asia-Africa. We established the new Asia-Africa Strategic Partnership, uh, as well as uh, bilateral relations um, 
and of course uh, our attention to uh, the rise of India, um, as well as uh, greater attention to BIMSTEC. So throughout uh, the development of all of, all of these institutions, uh, ASEAN with, with its uh, inclusive character uh, became the core of institution building. Um, and throughout the years, uh, you know, now we talk a lot about Indo-Pacific, uh, but actually the, the concept itself, call it proto-Indo-Pacific if you like, was in 2005 when uh, within the East Asia Summit, um, India was included together with Australia and New Zealand, uh, as well as the uh, plus three countries, China, Japan, Korea. So this was uh, an institution, an architecture uh, built to try to be uh, inclusive which subsequently developed in 2011 uh, with the inclusion of the United States uh, and the Russian Federation, um, and then also the establishment of the uh, East Asia Summit principles. And this, this is something that, that will continue to, to guide uh, our thinking within the East Asia Summit. Now turning to the uh, Indo-Pacific outlook with these developments, uh, it is a re reflection of uh, our thinking. So uh, we develop it further to, to recognize uh, on the one, one hand, the uh, prosperity and the potentials uh, that each country brings within the East Asia Summit setting, US, Japan, uh, China, uh, Russia. You know. uh, these are large economies. Uh, they, they have advanced technologies. Uh, the potential is there to exactly to address the, the world that, that has changed and continue to change. The challenges we face, uh, today's challenges, no one country can address on its own. We, we have to cooperate. Um, it's different from you know, the challenges of the classical times. But at the same time, there is also a fragility uh, in this. Um, tensions have to be managed. But again, it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, we don't believe that uh, countries have uh, intentionally in, uh, they like to uh, go into uh, wars or conflicts, uh, not by intention. Everybody's trying to um, uh, avoid uh, you know, the outbreak of conflicts. But we need to be very careful with uh, accidents happening. Uh, so th that's why a uh, situation has to be managed uh, and the importance of uh, therefore institution buildings, uh, the building of code of conducts um, and continuous dialogue processes. So in our concept of Indo-Pacific, uh, inclusivity is an important uh, principle. Um, everybody ought to be in, everybody has something to contribute. ASEAN itself is built on inclusivity. Uh, there's uh, democratic countries, uh, there are countries based on a certain political uh, party system. There's a country based on, uh, um, on a royal family. Uh, but we bring everybody to, to cooperate and develop this uh, sense of community. When we bring everybody together, not only are we responding to, to our domestic needs and to our external environments, but we also seek to shape, to shape the, uh, our environment. Uh, we second principles on uh, building comfort level and commonality, um, and not on threat perception. Um, and then the other one is to maximize uh, ASEAN centrality and mechanism. Uh, we, we have the, the principles, uh, we develop mutual respect, respect for international law, promotion and maintenance of peace, stability, security, prosperity, a number of other uh, principles. We need to avoid divisions. Uh, Southeast Asia has always been a, a region prone to, uh, to, to divisions. Um, we are aware of it. Um, other countries are aware of it. So the interest is to make sure that every country has an interest in, in keeping uh, Southeast Asia uh, open for everybody and that everybody respects everybody's right uh, for access 
uh, in this openness. Uh, we need to have realistic uh, cooperation projects in the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, one on, on the maritime side to build bridges uh, between uh, Indo-Pacific uh, centers of, of growth, um, connectivity. Uh, we should have a master plan of Indo-Pacific uh, connectivity. Uh, we should have uh, port development projects. Uh, we should be connecting the connectivities uh, between those uh, with uh, architectures. And this is the reason why our uh, scholars are here uh, exactly to do uh, research on that, to see what India is doing on its uh, port developments, uh, to see what India is doing in uh, port developments in, in other countries, uh, what the thinking is, uh, what schemes can be used, uh, India's experience in international cooperation for, for port uh, developments. Uh, and then we should also base uh, uh, all of these on the sustainable development goals. This is something that uh, can can provide an architecture in Indo-Pacific uh, development. Now, turning finally to the uh, India-Indonesia, um, we have a shared vision on Indo-Pacific. Uh, last May, it was uh, announced by Prime Minister Modi and President Joko Widodo, a framework for cooperation in trade and investment, sustainable development, maritime uh, of marine resources, disaster risk management, <coughs> tourism, cultural exchanges, maritime safety, security, academic, science, and technology cooperation. We have already manifested this in connecting uh, Andaman Nicobar with Aceh. Uh, and Vibanchu mentioned this. Uh, we, we are connecting. The first boat had uh, come to Port Blair early January. Um, and we are looking forward for the two, two chambers of commerce to to do actual things, sign contracts, and start to uh, open a trading relationship. Andamans can be a very important transshipment point uh, for India with Indonesia and vice versa. Um, ship, ships serving India, Andamans are there already. Uh, so we should uh, really work on this. This, to my mind, uh, will be the real axis of the Indo-Pacific region. India, Indonesia, uh, Andaman, Nicobar, and Aceh. It's really at the center of the uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, as well as of uh, the Bay of Bengal. Uh, we should uh, maximize the growing relationship in trade investment. Uh, recently, it was announced that an Indonesian paper company is investing 3.5 billion in Andhra Pradesh uh, to create one of the largest uh, paper companies. Uh, it was announced, uh, don't ask me the details because I also don't know, but I'm working with my Indone Indian colleagues uh, on this. Uh, connectivity, we, are, uh, we need to do more on air connectivity and maritime connectivity. And I think we have to be as ambitious as we were uh, 70 years ago. Back then, our leaders, uh, they, they thought in a big way. They wanted to shape the international order. I think that's how we should uh, think forward. Um, that's how they established the uh, Asia-Africa Conference. Uh, subsequently, the uh, non-aligned movement. Uh, yes, there were differences. Uh, but the ambition, uh, we should have ambition in shaping uh, the world around us. And I mean, look at, look at the potentials. Uh, Vibanshu talked about building ships. Let's think about building planes. Uh, India and Indonesia develop planes for our two countries. India is the largest palm oil consumer. Indonesia is the largest palm oil producer. But did you know that 95% of patents belong to uh, multinational corporations? You know, India has uh, research uh, capacity. Uh, we should be doing more on, on that. And that is uh, only uh, but one example. So we should... Uh, we should look at the comprehensive, comprehensive strategic partnership, the status uh, as, a, as an ambition. This is something that should guide us moving forward. Uh, and we should both, India, Indonesia, and all, all elements within, invest more in this, in this process. 
So with that, uh, thank you very much. articulated the vision that I think uh, the two countries have uh, in terms of not only shaping the bilateral relationship but the larger uh, Indo-Pacific order. Before I open this up for discussion, we have Ramesha who, is, who will, would like to sort of a bit respond to some of the things that have been said and perhaps present uh, some of her own views. Ramesha. Thank you, sir. Um, actually, being the last speaker, you, you don't know what is left for you to say. That is my challenge here. But I'll try and cover a few things which I feel was mentioned, but um, needs more uh, highlighting, probably. Um, firstly, uh, when, I was, uh, when both me and her, sir, we were planning this uh, discussion, the reason we included Indonesia is you can't talk about cooperation in the Indo-Pacific without including Indonesia. It's right there. It's, it's in the crossroads of the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. Its geography, it's a huge advantage. All the major choke points of the Indian Ocean passes through Indonesia, Strait of Malacca, Sunda, Lombok, um, uh, um, Omboy Betar, everything. So, and uh, even most of the major powers like Japan, Australia, US, they also realize the importance of Indonesia. I think uh, it was very clear in the Raisina dialogue last year that we tried, we invited Indonesia in our court panel and that was the time I think uh, we got a clear message that Indonesia is skeptical about joining the court and I think that also comes out from their message of how they want to strengthen further the East Asia summit. They're looking more into strengthening the existing mechanisms rather than involving themselves in new uh, institutional mechanisms coming out of the Indo-Pacific. I think that is even being put forward in their Indo-Pacific vision, uh, which they are trying to propose to the ASEAN countries. And even if you look at the, how the importance of Indonesia, Indonesia, like as Vibhangshu pointed out, it has played a very, it's very good in its leadership role, be it in ASEAN, be it in IORA. For the first time, there was a leader summit happening at IORA. They did a blue economic conference, which was also path breaking. And I think that is an important area of cooperation between India and Indonesia. Indonesia is doing a lot on plastic debris in the Indian Ocean. In the East Asia Summit, Indonesia and New Zealand organized a conference. And I think next time, maybe India can be a part of it, and or both the countries can do something at the level of IORA when we talk about uh, plastic debris and other kind of marine waste in the Indian Ocean. Uh, besides that, uh, India, Indonesia, Australia have a trilateral dialogue in the Indian Ocean, which is not very regular. I think the frequency of that can be increased. We can include other countries as well and make it a bigger platform and talk about further cooperation in the Indian Ocean because at the end, Indonesia is the second largest literal in the Indian Ocean and we cannot ignore it. Uh, if we talk about Indo-Pacific, I think 2013, uh, the former foreign minister, Martin Natalagawa, had spoken about an Indo-Pacific treaty of cooperation and friendship. So Indonesia's vision of Indo-Pacific has always rested on cooperation. It has always rested on inclusiveness. It has always rested on transparency. And the vision today is also being drawn from the 2013 Indo-Pacific uh, vision that they had. So uh, the recent, I would like to focus more on the foreign policy statements which have come out for the 2018 Indo-Pacific vision, I think, because that is more important and more relevant. So uh, Indonesia is speaking more of, as Ambassador has pointed out, of inclusiveness, transparency, they are prioritizing cooperation habit of dialogue, respecting international law, centrality of ASEAN, and they want to use something called a building block approach in the Indo-Pacific. Now, uh, what do they mean by this building block approach? So uh, scholars at CSIS and other think tanks in Indonesia, they have come out with this uh, analysis that the building block approach means cooperation of in the, within the existing bilateral and plurilateral framework, and they want to in, uh, strengthen uh, mechanisms like IORA, further cooperate in the Indian Ocean. So Indian Ocean is becoming much more important to them as uh, was correctly pointed out uh, by the ambassador. And uh, they are not opposing the free and open Indo-Pacific framework proposed by Japan, but Indonesia has its own vision which needs to be respected. And I think for cooperating with any country, you first need to understand what that country needs from you. So I think, an, Realizing the importance of Indonesia's vision of Indo-Pacific is very important for all the four core members or all the four countries which are championing the Indo-Pacific. And uh, Indonesia in the Indo-Pacific wants to cooperate in the maritime field, connectivity, sustainable development agenda. When we talk about connectivity, uh, our Sagarmala project is very active, but we are not looking into 
increasing that connectivity with other countries. Indonesia has a lot of trade with Aceh, with through the Mala Hayati port, but we hardly talk about including that in our Sagar Mala project about boosting connectivity. I think that is where we need to work. When we talk about Sabang, not much trading happens between India's ports and Sabang, but there is a lot of cruise tourism and tourism happening. I think that is another area of cooperation which we can look into. Bay of Bengal, again, uh, there have been proposals about including Indonesia and Beamstack. I think that's a very good proposal because Indonesia is one of the, Indonesia, Singapore, they are one of the uh, literal countries in the Bay of Bengal and that is where we need to even include them. It has been proposed by countries like Myanmar also. In our last Bay of Bengal uh, gathering here, it was proposed by Myanmar that we should be looking at including Indonesia in the Beamstack. Um, besides that, uh, when I was uh, researching on Sagar Mala and Global Matam Falkram, I realized how important the CTOL Highway, which is the infrastructure development program, is for Indonesia in the GMF. And most of the trading between Indonesia and India happens to India's western ports, which is at a further uh, distance from Indonesia. Not much happens to the eastern ports, and I think that is where the potential lies between increasing infrastructure connectivity between the two countries. We can look into increasing cooperation, between, uh, trading connectivity between our eastern ports and the Indonesian uh, western Sumatra, Padang. There are so many other countries. Padang has so much of Indian Ocean, Indian features in it. I think when I used to go out for pa Indian food, it was only Padang restaurants where I used to go to. So uh, that is where I think uh, your connectivity also lies. And uh, besides that, uh, Indonesia is talking a lot about reviving maritime culture. Though our project Mossam is not taking off in a big way, but again, there is a potential of the two projects, of the two ideas uh, being linked together. Corpat exercises, which is our uh, naval exercises, it happens, the frequency can be increased. Last year, we had a uh, inaugural India-Indonesia bilateral naval uh, exercise. We also had the infrastructure forum. Um, that is another good move, which should be continued and it should be taken further ahead. Um, Besides that, uh, Indonesia has, you see a lot of change in Indonesian stance in policies. Like initially, South China Sea, Indonesia has always maintained that it's not a claimant in the South China Sea dispute. But now we hear news of a new base being developed in the Natunas. So that, it can be seen as Indonesia being more active in the South China Sea, but there are scholars who are looking at it as Indonesia's eastern balancing in the Pacific. And I think that is where also the potential lies between the two countries to cooperate. If they're looking at developing an Eastern Command, as Vibhangshu correctly pointed out, they are, there again shows how much importance they're giving to the Pacific. And this is also in a way showing the importance that they are giving to the Indo-Pacific framework. Because when uh, Joko Vidodo, who is, going to, who is the current president, when he came to power, his election manifesto very clearly said that Indonesia wants to become a prominent player in the Indo-Pacific. And that is how I think these Eastern balancing, all these policies are heading towards. And uh, given Indonesia has always been very careful about the emerging dynamics in the region, it has always paid attention to that. And given that Indo-Pacific is emerging, that is where the country is heading. It is trying to play an important role, and India should take into account um, that thing. So uh, I think these are just a few points that I um, wanted to make. And uh, yeah, as far as uh, Vibhangshu's book is concerned, please give it a read. It's a path-breaking work. Not many scholars research on Indonesia in the first place, and it's a very good book to have an idea of Indonesia's rise, its foreign policy. And uh, yeah, I have uh, nothing more to say, as Harsh had pointed out the quad point, and so there is nothing left for me to say in that. But I think both of them have brought out some very good points, a joint initiative of a maritime domain awareness and a pan-Indo-Pacific maritime domain awareness network. I think that's a very good point, which can be looked into and uh, his point and uh, ambassador's point on east asia summit the potential that each country brings within the east asia framework east asia summit framework i think that's a very important point and that i think even the quad countries should be looking into what potential each of them bring to the platform so that can be copied in our future indo pacific institutional frameworks realistic project cooperation projects in the indo pacific master plan of an indo pacific connectivity i think that's a very good point i think that can be linked to asean master plan connectivity as well 2025. I think both the projects can work together. And um, port development, as I said, that the eastern part of India's ports needs to be in a greater way connected to Indonesia's western Sumatra and the southern part of Java, which is bordering the Indian Ocean. So, um, and Andaman can be an important transshipment point that has been in the cards for a very long time, but we need to do more on it. So, thank you. I think um, 
as you point out, one of the aspects of, of our engagement with ASEAN and, uh, and with Indonesia uh, is, of course, um, academic exchanges. So I think uh, that area has been relatively uh, less talked about, but I think holds immense potential. At the moment, I think the, uh, the expertise on Indonesia uh, in India is within this room. So it needs to be much more broadened, uh, and I hope that um, that the ambassador is giving many more scholarships to Indian students, or at least pushing for. And Indians are uh, giving more scholarships to Indonesian students uh, to come and study in, in in India. So I think uh, with that, let me open this up for discussion and uh, your questions, comments, and yes, sir. please uh, please introduce yourself very briefly. Just an introduction. Just a brief introduction. There's a lot been spoken about Quad and the Indo-Pacific. I just want to know that even South Vietnam actually have said that they're not going to join the Quad. In my view, if this Quad is going to be meaningful, at the moment it is low key, I know that. Without Indonesia, which is the predominant major player in the Indian Ocean, and, and Vietnam, which is at South China Sea, I don't see much future Quad. Even if Indonesia and this and Vietnam want to be ASEAN centric, which India wants, for infrastructure, for the economic development, eventually security, this becomes a base. So I really don't know what is the objection to becoming because your minister when he came here he said they don't want to be a member. South Vietnam has openly declared they don't want to be a member. So I, I if, if you could give some views on that. This trade. $15 billion when we were at 21, and now we want to reach 50. Now, what I'm trying to say is that it's a good figure, but what should we do besides, I mean, yeah, we build a common ship, that'll take a lot of money, build a common plane, but that's a bit early for India and Indonesia to be thinking about. I'm just trying to understand maybe the who have come from Indonesia, how do we fill this gap of $50 billion? And finally, BIMSTEC is a super vehicle who is objecting to Indonesia coming into BIMSTEC? BIMSTEC countries or Indonesia is not showing enough interest because the eastern port is all where BIMSTEC operates. And now we're talking of Andaman, Sabang, and sorry, one more thing. I was in Aceh post tsunami, I was invited. The, the, you were going to be the center of tsunami in this entire area. I'm sure that project must have developed further. That makes it even more important for you not only to be part of Indonesia, but also to technologically cooperate with the four countries of Quad for the development of this tsunami and the predictions about tsunami. Thank you, Chairman. We'll take a few uh, rounds. Yes, sir, the back. Sir, the back. sir, I do have a question to His Excellency. I do have a question to His Excellency. Uh, since we know that uh, Indonesia is at the nexus of Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, and uh, South China is recently becoming a playground for the war between the you know China and uh, United States of America. And as stated by the former President of United States, Barack Obama, that uh, Asia is in always in his policy. So we just want that the, the South China doesn't become a playground. And uh, about Indonesia, I don't see that there is a staunch statement from your country that whether you want to de-escalate the situation at the South China Sea or not, because many of the countries like Philippines, Vietnam, they have tried to, uh, you know, distort China. But unfortunately, I don't think I have got any specific statement from your country regarding the de-escalating the situation in South China, uh, South China Sea. Sorry. Um, there are understandably several strategic convergences between India and, the, and Indonesia, but what are the obstacles really in this relationship? Like, why haven't we realized the potential that is clearly so obvious, as pointed out by the panel? So let's take these questions. Okay, thank you, Arsh. Um, uh, a thought uh, crossed my mind uh, listening to your question, uh, General Chopra, and that is, uh, if you are serious about Quad and all its objectives, why not invite China instead? Have China in the Quad. I mean, uh, you have to have it there. Uh, then you can say it's uh, inclusive and you know, 
lot, lots of uh, misunderstanding can be sorted out there. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I must, I must intervene. If China is the source of the misunderstanding, then invite China into the purpose of their own enterprise. So I mean, uh, let's also be realistic a bit. I know you are a diplomat, but let's not play around the word. I mean, we are all here having a very open discussion. So if China is the problem, I, mean, I, I get the point of Indo-Pacific being a very inclusive system and from your perspective, but there has to be some frame of reference into how we define the parameters of even the Indo-Pacific or uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific. So uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, you know, General Chopra is, is, and I have also pointed out earlier that uh, what is a different, you know, it is still fledgling, and we are still looking at what to do with it. But if if our understanding of the problem is very clear, I mean, I don't think you you would disagree with me that our understanding of what the problem is is relatively clearer than our understanding of what Indonesia's sense of the problem is. You don't. It seems to me that you don't see any problem. Because if everyone is there, then no one is there. Then we are not talking of anything substantive, and we are only talking of rudimentary principles. Uh, and then principles operate uh, operate in a vacuum. Like, uh, you know, in, in a sense that if, if inclusivity, freedom of operation is something that we are talking of, who are we referring to? Certainly there is a problem, elephant in the room, and we don't want to talk about it, right? So I, so I'm sorry, I, I think, I think uh, I can't, I, ca I can't let you go with, with just being a diplomat. I think we have to be a, a bit more open with us here. No, uh, but uh, your points precisely under, underline my points. And being a diplomat, let me just say that uh, I look for opportunities, not problems. And uh, this is exactly what, what we're doing. If, if it is about China, then you can understand why uh, there's reluctance uh, about Quad. Because uh, that's what, what you just confirmed. Um, although my understanding from uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, speech at Shangri-La uh, somehow also uh, reduces this, uh, uh, the tension of the intention of Quad. Um, and I think that's a very important statement. And it brings Indonesian and Indian views uh, of the region closer, uh, the Shangri-La uh, statement. Um, on trade, I think we, we have to be, um, we have to go beyond natural resources. We have to go beyond the more traditional economics. Uh, we should go into uh, new areas of economy, uh, startups, uh, e-commerce, uh, building planes, uh, research, uh, research and more trade and investment. I think that's the new area that we should be going into. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we, we have been thinking about uh, having an India-Indonesia economic forum this year. Um, why not uh, think about new things to do? On the Indonesian side, if you want to be realistic, relying only on palm oil and coal, I mean, how much palm oil can you expect India to absorb? You know, it's not going to absorb uh, any much. The growth rate is not going to be any quicker than the growth of consumption itself. Uh, same with uh, uh, coal. So we have to look into the new areas uh, of economic cooperation. And I think institutions like the ORF can play a role. Um, I mean, to be very frank, uh, I don't think ORF also gives much attention to Indonesia. Uh, this is an exception this morning. <laughs> they have an Indonesian scholar. Um, so um, institutions like ORF can also do more to, to contribute uh, in this process. And you can keep coming to us. So and keep, I will keep, do so. Keep, keep giving us your time. So that's very kind. And I will do so. Uh, I have to check on the Aceh Center uh, for Tsunami. But I know that uh, HADR has been uh, increasing. It is one area of cooperation that, that, is, that can be realistically done among uh, armed forces. Um, and I know there are uh, more being done uh, in this field. And because also the challenges are more. Uh, I think the past 15 years we've seen more earthquakes, at least in Indonesia, more earthquakes, more tsunamis. Um, I think uh, around the world, more forest fires, uh, more uh, cyclones. So these are, these are important things. And assets to, to manage these, these things are limited. You only have so much, for example, um, uh, 
uh, fire extinguishing planes around the world. Uh, because fire happen at different times in the north and the south, so these can be deployed um, interchangeably, but not simultaneously. Um, on the South China Sea, well, uh, let me just underline that uh, Indonesia is not a claimant state. Um, for those who say that Indonesia is, well, show me what is the basis of the claims uh, under international law. We, ha we have not heard any basis for the claims. Uh, here says, here says we, we have heard. Uh, some say this, some say that. But when it comes to, to the uh, essence of the claim, what is the essence of it, we have not heard. So as far as we are concerned, uh, uh, we, we have, there's no basis for saying that Indonesia is a claimant state uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, yes, we are strengthening uh, military bases in the Natunas. Uh, we are creating, uh, uh, building uh, uh, more jointness there. Um, but we are doing it uh, around Indonesia. Uh, this is an archipelago, so it, it needs to be done. Uh, military assets need needs to be uh, spread out uh, around the country. Um, building, uh, there's a saying, um, good fences make good neighbors. So that's what we are doing. Um, as to obstacles in India, Indonesia, well, you know, uh, I think we are entering uh, another period of rediscovery, uh, India, Indonesia. Um, I don't know if uh, my guru here um, um, will, will agree with, with that, uh, having been doing India, Indonesia for such a long time. Uh, but I think it's a, uh, a rediscovery period. Uh, intentions are there. Um, we want to be doing more. The potentials are, are there. So it's just a matter of hard work and investing in this bilateral process. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Erna. I'm from the Policy Analysis and uh, Development of the Indonesian Foreign Ministry in Jakarta. Uh, I would like to contribute on the discussion of uh, Quad and Indonesian concept of um, Indo-Pacific. And it's more of my personal opinion and it's uh, Chatham House rule, so I can be open about this one. Um, it's not Chatham House. It's on the record. Oh, OK. Sorry. Okay, so uh, Quad is more like a containment uh, of uh, China. And the Indonesian uh, concept of Indo-Pacific is we uh, would like to materialize uh, the dawn of Asian century, which is focused on the economic side uh, of this uh, development. And uh, for materializing uh, the Asian century as the powerhouse of the global economy, it is impossible not to include China uh, in the process. So that's why uh, Indonesia want to be more of inclusive uh, uh, Indo-Pacific. And connectivity, uh, the one that we uh, study this year, is part, uh, the most important part and could be the common interest of the Indo-Pacific countries in materializing uh, prosperity in this region. Of course, through the common co uh, cooperation and also through uh, the stability, uh, uh, providing stability uh, in this region. And also some in initiative that uh, we have, I think Indonesia and India last year, uh, as Pa Dubes mentioned, is already uh, agreed on the maritime cooperation uh, sufficient uh, by uh, Prime Minister Modi and uh, 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 President uh, Joko Widodo and uh, between Ace and Andaman Nicobar. And also this year, uh, our center is interested in increasing uh, this cooperation into a sub-regional um, engagement within the uh, EMTGT, the uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand uh, uh, group triangle. triangle. And we would like to incorporate Andaman Nicobar as well as part of it. It's still uh, on, on, on the uh, uh, concept level. And we would like to develop this concept if uh, it's possible. And I would like to engage India and uh, China as the dialogue partners of this uh, IMTGT. So therefore, as um, the <laughs> Pramisha mentioned, the building block concept of the Indo-Pacific is one of it. So uh, we, we put which one uh, 
cooperation that might be working. It might be small bilateral like Indonesia, India, Ajana, Manikobar, and we also put like uh, IMTGT. And also India has a lot of initiatives, for example, in the Bay of Bengal, and also tri trilateral uh, highway with uh, Thailand and Myanmar, and also with uh, some other countries as well. For example, with Iran, you have uh, cooperation with Afghanistan on Jabbar. So I think it will be this building block uh, approach is uh, uh, really work. It's going to work, and I believe if we cooperate together with inclusiveness, could be materialize uh, uh, the the dawn of ASEAN century. Uh, that's my comment regarding this one. But also I have a question. If you're asking uh, Padubes uh, <laughs> about uh, Indonesia joining Quad, uh, what is your opinion uh, about um, India and Quad? Uh, uh, towards the inclusiveness of Indo-Pacific, are you uh, uh, as, as India is going to uh, move its vision uh, to be more inclusive Indo-Pacific, or is still want to be on the framework of of, of what so far Quad has been? Thank you. Good morning. My question is directed to the ambassador. Uh, so the, for the Chinese infrastructural developments in Indonesia, China's base, uh, Indonesia has basically adopted a B2B structure, like a business-to-business -business structure. So how do you think, how successful is it going to be? Hello, sir. So, uh, terrorism is one of the major security threat that in India is facing, uh, like in especially in 21st century. Sir, uh, what is the prospects for India and Indonesia's cooperation with the uh, security aspect? Can I remove questions, comments? Okay. I just want to express that. Good morning, everyone. I, on, on the trade aspect, India and Indonesia are quite similar economies. Both have high current account deficits. So would actual trade or increased cooperation be destabilizing for both economies? Because any incremental deficit on either side is going to spook foreign investors and create problems uh, which recently India faced due to the increase in oil prices. So I mean, it's, it's OK to increase uh, specific uh, cooperation, but it can be destabilizing for both economies if too much trade happens. That's my issue. One more. I have a small question about, uh, about the deforestation that has been taking place in, in uh, Indonesia and uh, what steps are you really taking to seriously uh, stop this menace? cutting woods away f and selling it for furniture being manufactured. Thank you. Yeah. you want to find a question? My name is Vijay Chauhan. I'm from Elnish Life Sciences. It's a pharmaceutical company. Recently, we have collaborated with an Indonesian company to import their products and sell it in India. My question is, is there any special discount uh, or duty relief in India available to us for importing Indonesian products and selling it in India? There are two things, Indo-Pacific and then India-Indonesia cooperation. On Indo-Pacific, I want to say one thing. I don't know how many people know about this fact, that the person who first mentioned this concept of Indo-Pacific was Dr. Kalidas Nag in 1941 in his book, India and the Pacific World. In fact, in page 241, he mentions about Indo-Pacific domain. And that, of course, refers more into cultural aspects, of course. Anyway, that's a different thing. Now, coming to this India-Indonesia relations, I think it's a classic story of one, what could have been, and what is it at the moment. I think this dating has been going on, off and on, for many years. But the marriage never consummated, essentially for a number of reasons. Vibhangshu talked about the doctrinal issues. I think that is also 
a very important factor in understanding Indonesian politics. For one, until the coming of Jokowi, Indian Ocean was not part of any military doctrine. It is only in that poros maritime dunya that Indian Ocean comes into the picture. But then the question is that although they talked about this concept of Indo Pacific, uh, concept of uh, global maritime fulcrum, it is essentially restricted to the development of infrastructures. Beyond that, it has not gone very much into any kind of a maritime vision in that sense. Secondly, Indonesian military still is the most important in terms of Indonesia's defense. If you look at the budget, even in the last budget, I mean, Air Force and Navy got only half of what the military got. I think the concept is still the internal security. Internal security. What is the figure? Just can you tell me? I mean, I had like I had two figures from the I think I'll, please, please, if you can provide that. Yeah, okay, sure. okay, I, I, I that's one. Now, second thing is that, you know, despite this talk about cooperation, let us be more practical in terms of, you know, even culturally, the two countries are different in terms of their approaches to foreign policy and otherwise. Indians are very direct. They want things to be done on such and such issues. Indonesians are not direct. You know, the typical Japanese approach of doing things, saying things very indirectly. And there, I think, comes a bit of a clash in terms of what can happen between the two countries. You know, one example is the Sabang port. I think Indians thought that it was a kind of a military access to the Sabang. I don't think that was the intention of Indonesia. Indonesians wanted some kind of infrastructure development or port or something. So there's a perception kind of a problem between the two countries where it comes. Now, I wouldn't call it suspicion. Maybe a better term would be unease. I think there's still a little bit of an unease to go into areas where the strategic and security issues are sort of you know, coming into the picture. Even on the question, not India, even within the region, for example, MSP, uh, the Barca Strait, you know, uh, patrol. Even now, is there no joint patrol between Malaysia, Indonesia, or Thailand? It is coordinated patrol, but no joint patrol between the three countries. So all kinds of you know uneasiness in terms of getting into any security cooperation, I think comes as a kind of an obstacle on the part of Indonesia to actually accept any kind of security arrangement within the region. And that's why you will see again and again Indonesia, despite the fact that they know very well that ASEAN is not a very uh, uh, sort of you know, important instrument to resolve many of the contradictions that have come today, but still Indonesia goes on insisting on ASEAN centrality and all that. Now, you see, on the question of China again, I think there's a definite difference in terms of the perception of the two countries. So I think she mentioned about the building block approach. If India-Indonesian relations have to really mature, I think we have to adapt a kind of a building block approach, try to pick out areas where there is convergence. Even if there is any kind of sort of the slightest doubt I don't think it will go very well. So maybe some of the suggestions that Ambassador has given, I think that could be the basis through which maybe a sense of trust and confidence between the two countries could be developed. And I think one of the main problems, of course, would always be the role of China. Even in the question of development, port development or any other development, 
kind of projects. Obviously, the moment you talk about connectivity that India is trying to build up, obviously they would say that, you know, what is the problem with the BRI? BRI is also a kind of a connectivity project. So you see the problem of, you know, in terms of perception, what it could be, I think will always come as a kind of an obstacle to bring the two countries to actually a situation where there are a lot of potentialities in terms of the relationship between the two. So maybe start with the small one, try to achieve as much success as possible, and then go into that kind of a situation where there could be widened the cooperation. And from two bilateral things, it could be plurilateral or minilateral kind of cooperation. I think we have to give a serious thought to how and I think there's a need for more a conceptual framework in terms of the relationship. And you mentioned about the educational cooperation. I think those are the areas, capacity building sort of you know, areas that could be promoted between the two countries in order to create the kind of trust and the kind of you know, a comfort level, comfort zone between the two countries. I think still, to my mind, you know, I have been involved with Indonesia for 58 years. Still, I think that comfort level is not there. And please forgive me. <laughs> I think there is a slight uneasiness between the two peoples or two countries, despite the glorious period that began with Sukarno and India at the initial stage. That pull factor is no longer there anymore. Thank you. Just a uh, uh, clarification on the budget thing. This is 2015. I'm not going to reveal the source. So. TNI Ankatan Darat got 8.6 trillion rupiah. TNI uh, Ankatan Laut got 14.53 trillion. Uh, TNI Ankatan Udara got 11.26. And that is 2015 since then. And that was not what they had expected. They had expected actually more. And there was a promise for more. But this is what they got actually. That was the actual one. And this is commission. Um, I'm not sure as to what commission. Uh, it doesn't mention the commission, which uh, uh, DPR, uh, which commission it was. Royal Commission, Commission Satu, I suppose. Uh, that's on, on the second part is, I think we've done enough building block. We've done enough waiting. And other great powers are already engaging Indonesia. South Korea, uh, uh, they had a, ma a wonderful idea of building submarine. They did one in, 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 in South Korea. They're doing one uh, uh, together uh, uh, there, and they're doing the third one in, uh, in, in Surabaya. And when I had a conversation that was uh, uh, last year in May, there was a, a sufficient progress. I wouldn't say great progress, but there was sufficient progress and uh, that they, they, the two uh, countries have achieved already on that. India, Indonesia, they have a lot of potential in, in, in terms of shipbuilding, and they can do it. So it's not a question of waiting. It's, it's not a question of like, you know, you can't keep building blocks. You can keep like, it's been like 20 years of convergence, 20 years. That's why I asked him, started my conversation in the beginning that what frame should I use? Because there have been, all these frames have been running around since like, and there have been multiple uh, uh, eminent persons groups, expert uh, 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 groups and all that. All these have been there. It's time, if you don't, you will, uh, uh, you will be left behind. There are other players that are already, they're more efficient, they're more smart, they're, they're doing business whether it's a, a, a private level or at the, at the government level. That's, uh, that's on uh, waiting uh, or not waiting. Uh, the second part, the Quad. Uh, but before, uh, before coming to Quad, the Indo-Pacific, I think uh, Professor Gosal was right that it, it's, it's a much uh, earlier concept. In 1948, there was a one Indo-Pacific Fisheries uh, uh, com uh, Commission. Uh, and uh, uh, it was it, this, this entity uh, came out of, uh, 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 it was of course a US-led initiative, 
and uh, uh, India, uh, I think uh, India, Indonesia, and uh, I think Singapore as well, and they were all uh, 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 the, the participants of this initiative. Later on, uh, the interesting part of this initiative is that the later on, its name was changed to Asia Pacific uh, Fisheries Council. And after, I think that was 78 and 1991, it was changed to Asia Pacific Fisheries Commission. The change of the name does signify some geopolitical over to, uh, uh, undertone of, of it. So this concept is very much an uh, 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 old concept. And of course, Mohammed Hatta's two ocean two uh, uh, continent concept is very much into Pacific. And in fact, two days, I think three days ago, Padino Pati Jalal called it in uh, this East Asia summit uh, uh, concept as uh, Indo-Pacific 1.0. So these, which is again, uh, the dates uh, before uh, uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's uh, the ocean of the, uh, the conference of two oceans and, and India's own uh, uh, scholarship on in Indo-Pacific that some people said it starts in 2007. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, referencing. Uh, having said on, on the, the history part of it, uh, the Quad, the Quad, there is an important narrative that Quad is, is a result of the failure of middle power uh, multilateral initiative. So the point, uh, uh, this, this, this point is important, that if ASEAN, and this point I've been trying to make again and again, and that's why in Indonesia's entry is important, that if ASEAN is not able to address South China Sea issue, Japan is not going to uh, 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 rely on ASEAN's initiative in discussing Western Pacific uh, uh, problems. India is not going to rely on ASEAN initiative to discuss the Indian Ocean problems. And whether we like it or not, problems are happening. Uh, hostilities are flaring up, tensions are coming up. My uh, senior colleague, Professor Hugh White, says South China Sea is gone. Whether you believe it or not, that's a different story. But you cannot deny, you cannot, you cannot just dismiss that there is a fear, there is a problem. And that's the problem that led to the rise of the Quad. Now what you can do is you can de-escalate. You can moderate the tempo, you can moderate the tension of it by inserting players which are benign players, which are, uh, which are excellent in, in leading uh, these regional initiatives. And that's where uh, Indonesia's role is important. If Indonesia is not, if Indonesia is not leading, uh, this is also Quad is a great power initiative. If in, sorry, if Indonesia does not die or like you know uh, uh, take a uh, take a uh, take a participation in it, it's going to whatever shape, whatever uh, outlook, uh, whether benign containment, whatever it is, it's going to go ahead. Now it's also up, uh, uh, upon Indonesia whether to be a part of it or whether to be. Uh, left out. If, if it's left out, then the ASEAN process itself will be in deep, 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 deep trouble. And that's something that one needs to take into account. Now, East Asia Summit, people say that East Asia Summit is, is, is the, I think there are going to be both uh, track one and track two discussions uh, on, on East Asia Summit, like how to, the, to come about this Indo-Pacific uh, uh, concept. Indo the Indonesia's Indo-Pacific Cooperation Agreement that it has like, you know, launched, it's wonderful, okay? It's very, very nice and like, you know, all these, this lot of like, you know, lot of pleasantries, free, open, transparent, inclusive. It's wonderful to hear, but it's, it's very difficult to, to you know, to, in, to implement. Because when Ibu Retno came up with that, the, with that whole formulation in February, uh, I think January 2018, she did not provide a means. The means actually is there. The means came from Pa Martin Natale Goa when he mentioned in DC that like, you know, there should be, this should be a treaty-based behavior. If there is a treaty-bound behavior also engaging the great powers, then the prospect for, or the potential for conflicts can be reduced. And this is what he was talking about. Ibu Retno has come up with a framework, but she doesn't have a means. Now, if Indonesia can combine these two, then it becomes, a, a, it, it, it becomes, it, it, it comes up as a workable formula. And that's something, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Padino Pati Jalal, he wrote, like he also came up with some suggestions. Economics, uh, he, he also insisted on uh, economic cooperation, that's wonderful, but Please make no mistake, if you ignore security, if you ignore geopolitics, uh, uh, it's a very uncertain world. Ibu Retno called it global, uh, 
Global Disorder. That was uh, the title of uh, her uh, presentation at CSIS. So these things need to be taken into account and how Indonesia wants to shape it is up to Indonesia and it has to play an active role. It cannot just sit back and rely on ASEAN. I think uh, that's what, this is my personal opinion, I think ASEAN is a weak strategy to deal with the Indo-Pacific problems. Thank you. Um, I just try to briefly uh, address each question because questions are very specific um, about the B2B Chinese investment in Indonesia. Actually, um, it's uh, in terms of infrastructure, but also in terms of um, new economy. So one example is on the um, um, what the uh, making batteries. So this is part of uh, new economy. Um, all of us, uh, all our relations with China is similar. Um, China um, is, uh, has grown uh, very large. At the same time, it also brings benefits. Um, so it's a matter of uh, how to address uh, this, the shifting relationship. Uh, it's not like China is only white or black, but it is, uh, it's colorful. The whole spectrum is there. Uh, so it's a matter of balancing. But the strategy of B2B is ensuring that there is no uh, uh, state guarantee towards any, uh, any projects. Um, no, so uh, we make sure that uh, sovereignty is not involved. Um, but China is, uh, is, is a neighbor. Relations uh, have been uh, to manage relations to ensure that it remains uh, productive. Uh, for both sides and for the region. Uh, on terrorism, we have uh, India-Indonesia dialogue on cooperation. Uh, there's a joint uh, working group. Uh, we have had dialogue about uh, managing extremism, um, uh, extremism and radi radicalization. Uh, a lot of talk on that. Um, it is a known fact that uh, for ISIS, uh, very few Indonesians, and I understand even less Indians, uh, have gone to ISIS. I think India and Indonesia have a good story to tell to the world on how to uh, uh, a dialogue about uh, Islam um, and something to, to show the world how pluralism and tolerance can actually work. Yes, we have also homework to do uh, in our respective countries, but it's also an example that we can together show the world. Uh, in terms of trade, uh, we should be looking at new areas. So one example is uh, Indonesia is opening market uh, for Indian uh, bovine meat, rice, non-basmati rice, uh, sugar, uh, pharma is uh, it's, it's more gradual, but it's taking place, and a number of others. On our side, we are studying also what more can uh, we trade in existing goods that India imports uh, a lot from the world, that Indonesia is still uh, only have a small share of it. Uh, but Specifically on the question of uh, discount for importing to India on pharma, uh, that I have to check, uh, but let's continue the conversation on this. The question of defor deforestation, uh, what's, what steps uh, to stop deforestation? Let me put it this way. Um, the people most concerned about deforestation in Indonesia are Indonesians, uh, that I guarantee. However, uh, Indonesians, uh, perhaps unlike our Indian compatriots, we are not good at uh, telling our story. Uh, I think that's a downside. I see Professor Goshal nodding, uh, knowing Indonesia for the last 58 years. Um, we are not very good at telling our story, but actually we have a good story to tell. The other thing is, how do you balance population growth and the desire to grow into the uh, middle class. Everybody wants to have the American dream and manage it and balancing it with uh, limited resources and then also with uh, uh, increasing uh, waste. How do you do it, right? I don't think we have found the answer to it. I think we have to um, 
you know, really have a serious, serious, uh, uh, serious thought about it and act seriously, not through incremental uh, uh, ways of doing it. India has a lot to share, you know, the Indian story about uh, using less water in agriculture. I think that's uh, something to something to share. Uh, but this is something that's ongoing, and we don't have much time in, in doing it. Uh, just some uh, some comments uh, about uh, uh, ASEAN. Uh, when you talk about ASEAN centrality, um, actually we mean three things. One is the centrality of Southeast Asia geographic location. That's why it becomes very important for everybody uh, perhaps more important than the institutions itself, is the centrality of the location. Second, we talk about the ASEAN institution where ASEAN drives the agenda. Uh, ASEAN holds the meetings, everybody come. Uh, it's an ASEAN-based agenda, everybody have a discussion uh, with outcomes and follow-ups. Uh, the third, when we talk about ASEAN centrality, we mean uh, where ASEAN provides the platform and everybody else would, would have their own thing going on. So um, in the uh, 17 years ago, it was a plus three. It had a spin-off of uh, plus three out of ASEAN meetings. The plus three country uh, got together. They wanted to establish their own FTA, uh, etc. Uh, I don't think they have reached that point yet. But anyway, the thinking is there. Um, there was the idea of a lower Mekong initiative um, or the development of the Mekong subregion. And Quad itself was also a spin-off from, uh, from the ASEAN setting. It provides a, a place. It sounds mundane, but if you don't have a place, uh, how are you going to talk? Um, final point, oh yeah, just let me mention also that the thinking about maritime region in ASEAN also developed uh, in 2003. It was not something that existed uh, long before. It's a new thinking, and it is uh, developing uh, into a evolving into the uh, Indo-Pacific concept. Finally, let me just say about the difference between an Indian and an Indonesian. So what's the difference? Um, I agree with Professor Goshal. There is that uh, uh, temperament side of it. So an Indian, uh, no, an Indonesian, if he disagrees with you 95%, 95%, he will still, he will not say no. He will not say no. Uh, he'll indicate, he'll behave, but he will not say it. An Indian, if he agrees with you 95%, only 5% disagreement, he will focus on that 5%. You think it's a... <laughs> but the key message here is uh, uh, managing expectations. We have to manage expectations. Uh, I think Professor Goshal will agree with me. I think we have to uh, agree about managing expectations. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Just one or two comments. Um, Vibhangshu actually ended by saying that Indonesia concentrating on ASEAN would be a weak strategy, and Ambassador ended up by saying 95% and 5%. So um, actually, your answer lies here. You see, uh, they will still look at that 95% benefits in ASEAN. They won't look at that 5% how ASEAN, to some, maybe the ASEAN centrality should be amended, and it should be, we should be looking at new mechanisms. And Indonesia has, I think, taken pride in the fact that it has always been the leader in ASEAN. Will it really want to give up that and give up an ASEAN strategy and give up that ASEAN centrality from its Indo-Pacific vision? That is also another question that needs to be asked. Indian Ocean, um, uh, Professor Ghoshal mentioned that only in Jokowi's uh, uh, statements we find a predominance of Indian Ocean. But even in uh, the previous president, President Yudhyana also talk about, talk, spoke about a lot of Indian Ocean. But the problem is, when they speak about the Indian Ocean, they only look at India. They don't look at the other 20 literals so much in the previous times. So uh, because of how relations with India improved 2005, the strategic partnership uh, came about, they thought that they're looking at the Indian Ocean, but they were actually just looking at India. So maybe we have to think about ways that they are looking at the Indian Ocean. 
and about the quad i think in principle both the countries do agree they also have they do talk about respecting international law i think that does have a hidden message about where it indicates uh, respecting international law from where it comes so in principle both the countries do agree and one cannot forget the huge chinese uh, population uh, indonesian chinese population that exists in indonesia so you cannot always uh, expect a country to forget all that and uh, completely piggy bank on four countries who are where pe- where it's being predicted by the scholarly world that it's a china containment strategy though we can debate on that there can be huge debates on that so that is also one aspa- aspect they have cooperated on bri but as uh, uh, the ambassador mentioned it's a b2b model so you see that they have taken care on they have drawn lessons from uh, countries like sri lanka and maldives so it is not completely cooperating with china they have uh, Ch- indonesia has maintained that fine line and i think that is also another lesson that we need to draw from that country so these are just a few things that i wanted to uh, say thank you uh, thank you I think um, all that's left for me to do now is to thank our three speakers. I think it has been a very useful conversation, uh, perhaps a beginning of many more conversations, and I think more open conversations about what we want to talk about. You know, if you want, I think uh, one of the lessons that that seems to be coming out of of this is uh, how you know there are some fundamental differences even in the way in which we are looking at the evolving balance of power, and I think that question. is at the heart of all these discussions what is indo pacific what is quad what is the role of china so i think uh, we can have uh, more open conversations especially among academics uh, as to where where does what what role will china play and therefore what role can countries like india and indonesia play in that in that spectrum uh, in in sense in 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 a larger sense of what kind of leadership role we are willing to take as leaders uh, at times uh, we have to make certain choices so when uh, a lot has been discussed about quad um, you know it is interesting that uh, you know uh, and i think uh, you mentioned um, you know what what might india do uh, what whether india would want to make an quad exclusive i think it is also a choice that one has to look at from the perspective of the chinese do the chinese want themselves to be included in the kind of arrangements that we are talking about and it's not evident to me that they want to be because they have a certain world view so i think it's not it's not a one way street that we create architectures and security systems uh, where we want to you know put in our uh, uh, you know uh, ideas behind them which we, it is also about what the chinese want from the system and so i think the creation of a lot of these and the success of a lot of these would depend on what the other side would want to do so i think the conversations uh, will have to be with the chinese between ourselves but also at a, at a broader level in terms of uh, where perhaps we want to go uh, and w- what is the end game that we are looking at so i think we can both agree on on a, on a very positive note that we all want a free and fair indo pacific we all want a, a space a maritime geography where international law is protected and preserved and enhanced uh, and countries follow that but i think the how do you reach that uh, that goal is something that we are still talking about and not the even the four countries of the quad have no agreement on on what exactly that that is supposed to do so i think this is uh, perhaps an important um, a, important phase of this conversation which is beginning in quad uh, let us also remember has been resurrected so it 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 came it died it was resurrected because the other side was was not particularly interested so i think i think there are there are issues around uh what kind of architectures we are developing and and how we want to take this conversation forward and i and i would certainly like to thank uh, the ambassador vivanshu uh, pramesha for for making this a very lively discussion and a very honest discussion so thank you all uh, for being here with us uh, and please join us for lunch thank you